Uh, welcome to a new episode of Genuine Rockstars. This Genuine Rockstar is Martin Suttle. Hi, nice to join you, Dennis. First things first, could you tell our audience who you are and what you do? I'm a lecturer in planetary science at the Open University in Milton Keynes, which is uh, the largest university in the UK, and it's a distance learning institute. I study and specialize in the interaction between rock and water on asteroids and comets in the early solar system. And I explore those interactions by looking at meteorites and micrometeorites that we find here on the Earth's surface. What got you interested in these objects and how did you end up researching them? So I was really interested in uh, geology and geography when I was at school. So I went on to study geology at undergraduate. In the last year, we had to do a six-month independent research project. Uh, and I ended up choosing something studying cosmic dust. And so these were tiny grains uh, known to come from asteroids and comets in space uh, that had been recovered from blue ice in Antarctica. And I found this topic fascinating, the idea that we could study ancient uh, geology formed four and a half billion years ago through these absolutely minuscule grains. My PhD was, was also on cosmic dust. Uh, and since then, I branched out to, to study even bigger samples, meteorites, and uh, sometimes objects through telescopes as well. So let's get into the meat of the micrometeorites. Uh, what are micrometeorites exactly and, and in which flavors or sizes do they come in and, and how on earth do we find them? Large asteroids suffer these major collisions which catastrophically break them apart and produce huge volumes of dust. And some of that dust spirals inwards uh, in towards the sun and is captured by the terrestrial planets, including Earth. Most of the grains burn up in the atmosphere uh, and we see those as, as uh, shooting stars. There are many different meteor shower events uh, throughout the Earth's year, which represent where the Earth's orbit has passed through a, a, a band of dust in space and has captured more of that dust and sent that to Earth. But for a special uh, subset of, of grains, for whatever reason, perhaps they're very small or they're traveling a little bit slower, they manage to survive this atmospheric entry process without completely uh, vaporizing. Uh, and they settle to the Earth's surface and, and, and they fall everywhere on the Earth continuously. And we get about 40,000 tonnes of uh, cosmic dust each year, uh, plus or minus a few thousand tonnes. So we get uh, micrometeorites from asteroids, but we can also uh, get them from comets. So uh, comets are made mostly of ice, but they have a small rocky fraction as well. So in practice, uh, that means we look in deep sea sediments, very far from continents, very far from where rivers dump sediment into the oceans, uh, where the sedimentation rate is very low, and therefore the cosmic dust uh, influx rate is, is a little higher. But we also study uh, in Antarctica where that ice and snow acts as almost a perfect repository for the collecting of uh, cosmic dust. You can actually uh, find micrometeorites on, on rooftops of buildings, of sports halls, and, and, and even your own house. I guess the answer is you can find micrometeorites literally anywhere. We call micrometeorites any grains of cosmic dust sort of less than a millimeter, approximately, all the way down to about 50 microns, which is uh, half the width of a human hair. Am I correct in remembering that most of the meteor showers, the, the known ones, they correlate with... Uh, comet uh, trajectories. So that's where we go through a path that a comet took X many years ago, and then we harvest them in like that. That's right. Yeah. So some of the most famous, uh, the Perseids, for example, and the Geminids, uh, th those are the names of two different meteor showers uh, that produce some of the most, uh, most amount of shooting stars per hour. Uh, they're associated with specific individual comets uh, that have come close to the sun in the past, release dust, and then Earth's orbit has passed through those dust bands. The micrometeorites are our only naturally delivered samples of material from comets. It's one of the only ways that we can study comets here on Earth, uh, you know, under the microscope. Yeah, you, you don't need to send one of those little nifty, expensive rovers to a co comet necessarily. If you keep your eyes open and you follow the protocol, you may be able to find such fragments on the roof of your house or barn. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what are the most exotic micrometeorites you've encountered or have been able to study? Uh, in 2020, uh, I described a small micrometeorite that contained a really weird alloy. So uh, alloy is a mixture of different metals. Uh, and that alloy was a mixture of aluminium, iron, and copper, which is a really weird blend of metals to find together because those metals have different geochemical affinities, different boiling points. We think that it might have been in some sort of exotic, very high temperature uh, impact. Uh, and under those conditions, they might cause the three different elements to group together to form these alloys. 
So this uh, ag aggregation of these different elements that we find together has only ever been reported uh, in the natural environment once before, and that's in, in another different meteorite, a big uh, sample, not a micrometeorite. Uh, so that was a, a really interesting and, and novel tiny grain uh, project that, that I'm working on that I think is quite interesting. So eight and a half million years ago in the Miocene, we know that uh, some asteroids in the asteroid belt uh, smashed into each other, uh, broke apart, liberated loads of dust, and produce something that we call the Veritas asteroid family. And so eight and a half million years ago, we expect Earth's sediments and, uh, to record a huge influx of cosmic dust. And so there's some uh, nice sediments on the coast of Italy in the Adriatic, a place called Monte di Corvi, which are known to sample this exact time range eight and a half million years ago. And people have gone there before. And, uh, and so we know that there should be elevated cosmic dust there. So I want to go there, collect some of these rocks, dissolve them in acids, and look at the residues that remain in the hope of finding ancient grains of cosmic dust that fell to Earth eight and a half million years ago. And this would be really exciting because uh, unlike most micrometeorites where we get them and uh, we study them, but we don't know really exactly where they've come from, these grains, uh, we'd have that context because we know they came from that major asteroid collision. We know they came from that Veritas asteroid family. What are actually the chances that we find a micrometeorite on Earth that has an origin that's outside our solar system? The problem is catching it, uh, identifying it and catching it. So these objects that have come from outside our solar system are traveling very, very fast. If they were fortuitous enough to be captured by Earth's gravity, they would have entry speeds, really extreme entry speeds, perhaps even as high as 80 kilometers a second. So we would expect the vast majority, if not all of the uh, interstellar micrometeorites to burn up in the Earth's atmosphere and, and not survive to the Earth's surface. I think we'd be very hard pushed to to uh, find these among the, this uh, kind of needle in the haystack, and then also to realise that it is interstellar. So it's not impossible, but uh, it's I think it's many years away. A non-zero chance is uh, what makes most enthusiasts like enthusiastic. To begin with, uh, it sounds like a, a field that can benefit a lot from citizen science because uh, more eyes you have, the more people you have contributing to the effort, obviously increase the chances of finding uh, micrometeorites. I paired up with a, uh, a citizen scientist, uh, Thilo Haas, and uh, he'd, he, got, he got in touch with me actually uh, a while back now and said, hey, I found about 300 micrometeorites uh, from a single rooftop of a furniture building in Germany. So a lot of these micrometeorites, for example, uh, that we find in urban environments, uh, because they've been on the Earth's surface for a very short period of time, talking a matter of years, um, they've had less interaction with, with water uh, and, and an Earth's atmosphere, the oxygen oxidizing environment that damages and weathers and breaks these particles down. And so many of them retained what we call platinum uh, metal group nuggets. So these are tiny little beads of platinum and iridium and gold and, and those sorts of, of elements uh, in these micrometeorites. And so that allows us to study these uh, unusual elements, platinum group metals, which uh, have certain unique and interesting behaviors that we might otherwise be missing when we study micrometeorites that have, you know, we collect uh, perhaps from Antarctica where the micrometeorites have been on the Earth for longer and it, they've weathered and lost those phases. But essentially you need to choose the rooftop you're looking for very carefully. You need to choose a rooftop that's ideally very large, very flat, uh, built industrial buildings or school rooftops or things like that work quite nicely. Uh, and you're looking for areas where perhaps they haven't been cleaned in quite a while and you've got a bit of dust and, and, and a kind of residue that you'd sweep up on the roof. And they often collect in the corners or where there's other bits on the roof like pipe work that you know, inhibits that flow. Uh, and then you would process that material. Uh, initially, we, we kind of wash the dirt, as it were, and that stops all the grains sticking together. So we can do that with things just like a fairy liquid, for example. Uh, and you want to pour off, uh, unfortunately, the very smallest fractions. So we can uh, use kind of like a large uh, container filled with water and the dust at the bottom and you agitate it and you get the very, very small grains in suspension. You can pour that water off. And that's simply because the, uh, these very, very, very small grains, the kind of one, two micron size, uh, make it very difficult to process and handle the sediment. Uh, and we then usually uh, use a magnet to uh, extract the, anything magnetic out of that material. Uh, and that's because most, but not all, micrometeorites are magnetic, which means that uh, by using this magnetic extraction, we can kind of preferentially collect them. Of course, anything and everything you do has a, all these processes has a, a step where we're introducing a bias and maybe we're losing some 
of the, for example, non-magnetic micrometeorites. So once you've got that magnetic fraction and you've got your dry, clean, magnetically separated sediment that you look at under a microscope, and you're looking for tiny, round, spherical, shiny, black, or occasionally silver or maybe brown uh, balls, which are, which are called cosmic spherules. And when they came in through the Earth's atmosphere, they heated up enough that they melted and pulled themselves into a drop. And those are the, kind of, by far most of the micrometeorites we find on the Earth's surface. And then when you pick them all out, this is where you've got to really confirm that they're actually micrometeorites. So as a scientist, we would set them in resin, section them, and look at them under our scanning electron microscope so we can measure their chemistries uh, and also look at their textures under very, very high resolution. Uh, and so that's usually when the citizen scientist or the uh, school uh, group needs to kind of pair with the scientists to have access to those facilities. But then that's when we can actually start to do some of the really exciting science uh, and, you know, look at the mineralogy or maybe the isotopes or, uh, you know, the composition of these materials uh, and use that to say something about the composition of the dust falling to Earth or the composition of asteroids in the asteroid belt, that sort of thing. So. Wow, it makes me all excited to get my hand on this as well. Which advice would you have for our viewers that are also interested in pursuing a research career in uh, planetary science? Planetary science is kind of an interdisciplinary subject. They might come from a physics background and have uh, maybe uh, studied physics at A-level or university purely. Uh, or they might come from a geology background, which is kind of uh, my, my training. Uh, and so I, I understood the rock part uh, and I had to work to ensure that I had the, the kind of mathematical skills uh, alongside that. Uh, but also being so interdisciplinary, there's many other kind of perhaps less obvious tracks. You might study maths at university, or you might study maybe uh, coding, for example, or um, computer science, because uh, a lot of the modeling that we use to support kind of, you know, say the uh, orbital mechanics, how asteroids move in space, reconstructing uh, planetary interactions, that's all uh, fundamentally coding. Uh, and in planetary science, you have this really unique uh aspect because we've got all these exciting space missions, you know, run by NASA, the European Space Agency, JAXA, for example, going to different small bodies and icy moons and, and Mars, of course, and the moon uh, to keep uh, to keep the community, uh, you know, filled with new and interesting data and making headlines. Uh, and I, I think that's probably one of the one of the things that pushed me into a career in planetary science was as I was studying geology at undergraduate and even before seeing all these high profile missions, you know, uh, New Horizons to Pluto, for example, uh, in the news and in the headlines, uh, I, th I think there's nothing for me more exciting than being involved in that. No, we're one big family, uh, Martin. Uh, all right, Martin, thank you so much for talking micrometeorites with us today. You're a genuine rock star. Yeah? It was my pleasure. Thank you very much.